Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and I am late to the party today. Uh, I went striped bass fishing this morning on a lake in Georgia and we, they weren't biting too good, too well, but we, we, um, we did catch, I think, four or five anyway. Striped bass, it, when they are biting, can, they'll, they'll bite like, almost like a, a feeding frenzy. But today they weren't biting at their best. Now I wanted to show you this clip. Uh, this guy is um, Dan. Uh, uh, what's his name? Dan uh, Moorhead from Pantera. He his company invested in Ripple early on. I wanted to hear let you hear what he had to say. About sure. So you know, market. Bitcoin is much more volatile than you know most of the asset classes we're used to trading. But keep in mind, it's only twelve years old. You know, it's a very young asset class. Every year, it's been declining in volatility. So. Uh, this bear market's down 55% from uh, April and May. Previous bear markets averaged 83%. So although 55 is a very big number, it's less than we used to do. And I think 10 years from now, when blockchain is an asset class and every institutional investor has a large allocation to Bitcoin and other blockchains, that very broad ownership will allow it to be much less volatile than it has been today. Okay. So he just gave you a Bitcoin 700K prediction there. Um, and he says that uh, on why he predicts Bitcoin. So anyway, lot, we have a long way to go with this new asset class. Okay, now I wanted to know most of what's been going on today is the Gary Gensler drama. And people have just been piling on Gensler. And he's earned every bit of it because he agrees with everything Jay Clayton's ever done and will not even talk about Ethereum. So I'll tell you this right off the bat. I have a ton of stuff here and I want you to see it all. If I have to cut it off so the video is not too long, I'll go ahead and do a second video and just set that to release at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning so you can get that part. So here we go. Um, the first thing I want to show you though is I had retweeted this uh, an article about can the Fed avoid negative interest rates. Remember when Gary Gensler yesterday, when he was doing that interview, remember when he said he made a comment about some of these crypto platforms are paying four to five percent as if that was a bad thing. You know, where everybody in this world is dying for some decent interest rates and the banks have screwed the pooch. And so now we're at the point where we're, not only are we not getting any, any, anything on our money, but they're paying negative interest rates. Okay. That is absurd, which the fiat banking system is absurd, and so it's absurd. Well, anyway, I had retweeted this article about that, and I was saying Gensler mentioned this, and this is why it's a problem for these government folks, because they know that they've got to impose negative interest rates, and so it just wouldn't do for any of us to be out here earning 4 to 5% on crypto. And of course, Gary Gensler's only interested in doing this because he wants to protect you, right? He wants to protect somebody. That's for sure. I don't know if it's you. Well, anyway, when I, 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 I was looking at this and it just something clicked in my head and I was like, wait a minute, I've seen this scenery before. Okay. And what I remembered was that this scenery was from, you'll, you'll remember this. This is when um, Mark Carney, who was the governor of the Bank of England, this is the famous clip where he's being interviewed by this guy who I think is a complete moron on CNBC. He's a tool of the whoever whoever is paying him to do their bidding and 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 rah rah the central banks and all this. He he's the the man for them. Okay. Anyway, listen to what and I'm just gonna play a brief just to remind you of what Mark Carney said the significance of what Mark Carney said in this clip. If I can hit the refresh button and make it play, we'll make this thing work. You dropped Let me go the bombs. to here. Okay, the dollar is the global currency, we know that. The challenge is that the U.S. share of the global economy has been uh, reducing. Uh, the dollar's share of payments, not just financial assets, but payments, a lot of 
payments between countries that have nothing to do with the U.S. are in dollars. And what happens in situations like we're in today, where the U.S. economy, to its credit, is relatively strong, is doing better, and the Fed has been doing the right thing, which is, uh, you know, they've adjusted policy, they tightened policy as it was strengthening. Uh, now they're making, you know, you know, the Fed they're doing the right thing, but they have adjusted and policy is relatively strong. That means rest of world policy is strong, is tighter than it needs to be, and that feeds back on the U.S. economy in a way uh, that ultimately slows this economy. Um, and it leads to a substandard outcome. And in a world where you only have limited policy space, it's a dangerous place to be. And it's so the trade issues we're talking about are. Re so anyway, that's a famous clip. We've shown it on this channel a thousand times. But I kept seeing that scenery, and what? So so I was, I was looking at that, and I was like, wait a minute. So now this is purely. Now I tell you that there are no coincidences. Well, you tell me. Is this a coincidence? Because I had no idea where they filmed this, but I was on vacation in Jackson Hole last month and I recorded this video right uh -huh. here. Listen. Now that is what you call a view. That is quite the view right there. Grand Tetons. That's my nine-year-old year saying, yep. Okay, so my point in telling you that, just so you know what that is, it's called Jackson Lake Lodge. That is, if you look at that fence post right there, you'll see in the video, that's that. This, and I actually ate in that dining room, and you're looking out at that, and there's those mountains. So I had no idea where they filmed that one, and I've shown that video on this channel a thousand times. I'm just showing you something I think is kind of crazy and weird. It's a small world, isn't it? Okay, um, now, after, look, as of today, I did, you know, I, we had theories, but as of today, I am convinced a thousand percent that this thing with Gary Gensler, SEC, it is a, a turf war between the SEC and the CFTC, and, and Christian Carlo came out swinging, and also the guy who runs the CFTC now came out swinging. Look at this. Only one, remember, Christian Carlo heads the Digital Dollar Project, and he used to be the head of the CFTC, the chairman. Only one U.S. regulatory agency has experience regulating markets for Bitcoin and crypto, and it is not the SEC. It is the CFTC. If the Biden administration is serious about sensible cryptocurrency regulation, it needs to nominate, nominate a CFTC chairman. And then this guy is the uh, CFTC commissioner, just so we're all clear here, the SEC has no authority over pure commodities or their trading venues, whether those commodities are wheat, gold, oil, or crypto assets. So you can see some feathers getting ruffled and what's really going on. Now, Brad Garlinghouse also wanted to respond to what um, Gensler had said yesterday. In 2018, Hinman, Bill Hinman said Ethereum isn't a security and Jay Clayton agreed. But just weeks ago, Hinman filed a sworn affidavit, affidavit in court saying the SEC still has not taken any position or expressed a view on Ethereum's status. So how it how is the market supposed to have clarity? And he's retweeting Michael Arrington's tweet I think we talked about yesterday. One thing Gensler made clear today, he thinks all of crypto is under his control and he's eager to expand the power of the SEC. He said the law is clear based on 75 enforcement actions, but seems to be walking back clarity on Ethereum at least. All I see is more muddy water. You know, and um, okay, now let me go to here. Today was Brad Garlinghouse's turn at this Aspen Secure. I can't remember what they call it. Security, yeah, Aspen Security Forum. Okay, this is a clip I clipped together the most interesting parts in my opinion from his interview. Here we go. The one thing I would add is the other elephant in the room, I think, is the lack of clarity that has gone on in this industry. And, you know, for years, I think the crypto industry has asked for that clarity. And yet, you know, we're still getting this kind of, hey, I mean, yesterday we heard it is clear. You know, yet a few weeks ago, we had two commissioners and Pierce and Roisman saying, you know, a letter, and I'll quote, 
you know, the, the, they said a decided lack of clarity for market participants around the application of the securities laws to digital assets and their trading. So to me, one of the elephants in the room is we can't keep saying it is clear when, and then trying to make it clear through enforcement. You see other G20 markets like the UK, like Japan, like Switzerland, like Singapore, who have been proactive and engaged. And that has helped that those these markets thrive in those countries. If the US wants to be a leader in this space, then we need to provide that clarity and not you know, act like there is clarity. It has been extremely strategic on this point. As Segal already pointed out, they started years and years ago. The U.S. is very late to this party, and uh, the U.S.'s engagement, as we've heard, is you know not <laughs> so far in supporting. You know, the, the United States, the Internet of Information, as we, we know it today, in part thrived because there was that regulatory clarity in the late 90s. And we're, we're doing the opposite here. Here's a massive new industry that I believe without question will be, will underpin the future of our financial systems, not just around payments where Ripple primarily works today, but more, more broadly than that. And if the US doesn't get ahead of this, if we don't have that clarity and that certainty, and again, I, like, I, I thought what, in my judgment, you know, when you're dealing with an alcoholic who doesn't want to admit they have an alcohol problem, you know, to say that we have certainty, we have clarity is like the alcoholic saying, I don't have a problem. Like this is the elephant in the room. And I, I think, you know, what you've heard from Seagal, I think very eloquently, if we don't address it. Did he just call Gary Gensler an alcoholic? <laughs> fall further behind. Since the SEC filed their lawsuits against Ripple, we have signed dozens of new contracts with banks and payment providers around the world. And I think only one here in the United States. It, 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 you know, the, the lawsuit effectively has stymied the United States customers. Like, well, you know, if the SEC is doing this and some of these are public companies, like we're not going to touch this until there's resolution. That just puts us further behind. I think this is an important time to remind you um, who the, uh, the SEC chairman have worked for. We know that Jay Clayton what represented Goldman Sachs and we know Elizabeth Warren complained before he was brought in as chairman of all of his ties and conflicts of interest with Goldman Sachs. She doesn't seem interested in it now at investigating him or anything like that. We also know that Gary Gensler was with Goldman Sachs for 18 years. We also know that Joseph Lubin, the co-founder of Ethereum, was at Goldman Sachs. He was in cryptography. We also know that because Charles Hoskinson was one of the creators of Ethereum, he said in a video I've played on this channel that some of their first programmers were from Goldman Sachs. I think he said high-level programmers, from, or somebody did, from Goldman Sachs. Just wanted to point that out. Now, I wanted to show you this before I finish this video. Um, Ex-U.S. Treasury Undersecretary for TFI. This is from John Deaton's law firm. For TFI, Segal Mandelker today warned the U.S. enforcement-only approach to crypto has given China big advantages and threatens to leave the U.S. behind. She notes Alipay has more users than all other global fintechs combined. And maybe it's important to let you know at this point, um, it was Alibaba, that, um, uh, which is a Chinese company, that Jay Clayton helped to take public before he was at the SEC. And also, I believe William Hinman helped them go public as well. Okay. Now listen to what she says. Enforcement only approach landed us. It landed us in this place where we we have huge gaps around the world from from a U.S. financial um, uh, center perspective. Without a doubt, China is taking advantage of that. You know, it, it's it's no accident that there are more Alipay users today um, than all of the major other global fintechs uh, combined. And we have to make a decision, right? The US government really has to make a decision as to whether it wants to be at the center of what I believe we have um, potentially in crypto, which is transformational technology that can bring many, many more people um, into that financial ecosystem. And that, from my perspective, is the real national security issue. Because if we enforce if we shove these innovators who are like extraordinarily big brains, right? If we just push them out of the United States, I fear that three to five years from now, we're gonna wake up in a fundamentally different place from, 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 a, from a global financial infrastructure perspective. And the US is gonna get, um, in, in many ways, in many parts of the world, we're really gonna get left behind. Well, 
I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, and tell your friends and family that I believe that the real national security issue in the United States is all of these politicians and people that have been put in all these places who are saying that the sky is not blue when it's blue and who are lying their teeth off. Uh, oh yeah, we got re we've got clarity when we don't have clarity and they know it and are telling you that it's raining outside when it's not raining outside. These people are a poison. And if, if, if nothing is ever done about this, our country, our country is headed for some really bad places. And I, I have to believe, for my children's sake, I have to believe that at some point the truth will shine through on all this because these guys, there is no truth in what's being said. There is no truth when Ann Emanuel says, wait a minute, well, Ethereum, by, by these rules, Ethereum's a security and they're working with a team. What, what about them? Oh, we can't talk about that. That's not truth. There's nothing about that that's truth. That is at best trying to avoid truth, but at worst, it's trying to sell a lie. And that cannot stand, not in this country, really not in any country, I hope not. That can't stand. Those kind of, that kind of way of thinking cannot stand and I hope that the American people will not stand for that and I think that these people that think that's okay and it's okay to, to carry those kind of of untruths and that that's going to be okay because we're they're protected by so and so or so and so company or so and so group of powerful people I hope that those people realize at some point the American people will have had enough. The world will have had enough. Thanks for listening.